All right, goedenavond uh, allemaal. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Machiel Kees. I'm the Central Diversity Officer of the University of Amsterdam. And I'm really pleased to see such a large crowd. Welcome to this uh, special evening dedicated to controversies in academia. Uh, in particular, are we going to explore the discourses on feminism and wokeism? Of course, wokeism is uh, um, quite a current uh, thing, but we wanted to zoom out a little bit, have a somewhat more uh, um, also historical comparative perspective to put uh, uh, stuff also in uh, perspective. Um, but uh, first, maybe it's, it's good to, uh, to realize also from this uh, perspective that um, not just academia is changing all the time, but also our morals and our morality. For instance, today is Animal Day as well, had Dierendag. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting phenomena in ethics and in our everyday ethics is that the, the circles of our moral concerns or moral rights have been expanding over over the ages. Um, for uh, quite a while, children were not really deemed uh, morally uh, having the same rights as others. And indeed, animals have, gr have been granted rights over the past uh, decades, which was quite a new phenomenon. And right now, um, there's even a discussion on granting moral, um, moral rights and responsibilities to rivers, oceans, etc. So uh, not just science is changing, academia is changing, but also our morality is changing. Not always for the good, um, listening or referring to the history of feminism. Right now, um, as I think most of you are aware, um, many of the rights, the women's rights, reproductive rights uh, that we've <laughs> seen developing, growing over the past decades are um, r risking to be turned back. Uh, abortion laws in the US have been reduced or even annulled. And it's not just in the US that these, uh, 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 well, turning back of the clock is, is happening. It might even occur here on the European continent. Another example is that, of course, in, in Iran at this moment, uh, at the universities there, but also um, outside of the universities, uh, women are being arrested, uh, um, tortured, um, abused um, because of the, the headscarf or their immoral behavior as it is uh, considered right there. Um, and um, indeed, compared to maybe 50 uh, years ago or more, that's also completely uh, turning back off the clock. So let's, let's um, keep that in mind. We're trying to push the boundaries, but sometimes these boundaries are, are being pushed, uh, pushed back. Um, I'm going to offer a brief introduction to tonight, and then I'm going to introduce you to the panelist, and uh, then hand the mic over to um, our poet of today. But before that, uh, let me very briefly um, introduce, let's see if that works. No, it doesn't yet, but maybe, well. There we are. So um, as I mentioned, I'm the diversity officer, the central diversity officer at uh, University of Amsterdam. And it makes you wonder, are there local ones? And indeed, there are local ones. You're seeing a portrait here of the faculty diversity officer. So the University of Amsterdam has a whole structure. And the diversity officers are part of that, and I'm hoping a key part, um, in implementing the objectives of the uh, memorandum on diversity. Uh, several of these objectives are listed here. And you are part right now, I think, of objective four, which is the uh, exchange of ideas and uh, um, um, instilling uh, good practices. And I think a good practice in academia is having a, an academic conversation on, on stuff like this. Um, then I'd also like to introduce uh, this is a large picture, but it doesn't work, apparently. Uh, I wanted to introduce you also to, uh, to the team of the Central Diversity Office, uh, but I can maybe ask uh, my colleagues to, to briefly stand up so you can see maybe afterwards. Uh, so we are um, quite a large crowd. Um, let's uh, make it clear, part-timers um, generally. Um, trying to push from the Maartenhuis, which is the castle or the tomb here just uh, across the, the alley uh, of the University of Amsterdam, trying to push the envelope for uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, then, 
I will not wait for the picture here. So the occasion of today is um, actually a diversity day which has been um, announced by the um, Social Economic Rat, the Social Economic Council, uh, trying to, um, well, to inspire, to motivate, encourage um, organizations all across the country to um, reflect on um, diversity in a very open way, uh, also to inspire and motivate people to uh, implement new measures, etc. And um, it's not just uh, like firms, but also universities and uh, universities of applied sciences, the HBOs, uh, uh, which are uh, participating in this. And today's uh, or this year's topic is difference and riches. And I think it's really good to, um, to make explicit here that uh, this sounds really positive, and I think, of course, uh, it is. But um, this enrichment often is being accompanied with some struggles, with some uh, uh, serious discussions. Because whenever the diversity in a group uh, grows, when the homogeneity uh, disappears, there is an enriching. We know from a lot of evidence that the creativity uh, um, is, is enhanced in such a group, that the sensitivity for individual differences is also uh, increased, but we should also not neglect the fact or deny the fact that then uh, sometimes really principled uh, discussions and arguments are being raised, um, which of course in an academic environment is precisely what we are for, so I'm really happy to see and to maybe also to contribute the growing uh, diversity and inclusion at, uh, at the University of Amsterdam. Um, It's uh, uh, the virtual presence is not always uh, optimal. I see uh, there's between this and that uh, quite a, uh, a gap apparently. But um, I don't think I need to uh, mention all the books that are listed here. What these pictures uh, were meant to show you, maybe needless, um, is the fact that uh, woke, wokeism, cancer culture, etc is not just an academic affair, of course, but is an affair that has been uh, in, in a public arena for a while now. Uh, many publications uh, are being uh, um, discussed also in, in, uh, in the media, uh, public debates, etc. And um, in many cases, uh, there are really concerns being expressed in these, uh, in these books, in these publications, or in the uh, uh, talk shows or whatever, uh, like that uh, the, for instance, in academia, the academic freedom is under attack due to um, particular social justice claims. Um, if we would look for a, like a dictionary uh, reference on woke or wokeism, um, generally uh, the explanation of the word is something like uh, so the, uh, the claim to have social justice norms or claims being integrated or being attended to more than has, had, has been the case. So being awoke means also being aware of uh, social um, injustices or inequalities, often um, uh, referring to uh, gender issues or ethnic or racial issues. Of course, in an American or English context, it's often race, but uh, in, in a European context, that, uh, uh, that word is not used in the same way as in the, uh, in the US. Um, what we're trying to do here is to, to make this, uh, to take this phenomenon really seriously and to see whether we can maybe uh, learn from, from the criticism of both uh, sides of the, of the aisle, so to say, and to see whether we can um, come up with some ideas on, on how to then respond to these uh, particular claims. And of course, um, I've invited, or we've invited uh, uh, the Central Diversity Office um, a couple of guests, and I'm um, going to introduce them to you now, and that's why I'm going to put on these glasses, because the, uh, the information on the, on the speakers is uh, just printed too small. So first of all, um, uh, I need to apologize for uh, René Rumkens, uh, who was invited, but uh, just yesterday uh, announced that she uh, had attracted corona, so she had to stay at home and couldn't, and even like 
she mentioned, uh, was also half-brained due to corona. So even a virtual presence would not be re doing justice to her nor to the topic. Um, and I'm really very pleased um, to, uh, uh, in a moment, invite uh, Miley Harrier to the stage, who has been willing and able to leave, actually, the, the moving boxes of her husband uh, for, for a while uh, and to appear here. So my apologies to Rain Jan uh, for this. Uh, um, and uh, so Marley is uh, actually quite unprepared. Uh, that is for today's panel, maybe a bit. But on the other hand, she has a long um, well, uh, career in academia and also with the topics uh, here at hand. Um, she is best known, I think, um, by, by most of you as the Denker des Vaderlands. I think it was the second one or the third Denker des Vaderlands, a couple of the third, yeah. Uh, so the, the, I think Thinker Laureate would be uh, the appropriate uh, English translation. Um, she just retired as a professor in public philosophy at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam and uh, before has been a diversity officer at the, at the Faculty of Philosophy there. And she also uh, published on a wide range of topics, including gender issues, uh, often many medical uh, topics, uh, medical ethical uh, topics, but also books on, on uh, discipline, on the navigation of time. Um, so uh, in that sense, uh, Marley has, has perhaps the longest preparation for tonight, uh, like decades of preparation. Um, then um, the next guest will be, uh, um, or will sit here uh, at the table in, in uh, uh, 50 minutes or so, um, because the poet will be first. I'm, I'm going to shut up in a moment. Uh, uh, the second guest, uh, second panelist, is Alana Helberg Proctor. Um, who is now still a postdoc at the uh, um, University of Leuven. I hesitated to, in a way, um, uh, integrate her already at UFA, because uh, starting January, uh, we'll be colleagues. Alana will be assistant professor at the Social Sciences uh, Department. Um, and um, her research and teaching focuses on race and ethnicity in relation to health and health science. Um, um, her PhD has been on undoing ethnicity, analyses of the socio-scientific production of ethnicity in health research in the Netherlands. So much of her work is also on the, uh, in a way, the production or reproduction of, of the categories of race in medical research, medical uh, practice, diagnosis, etc. Um, like the undesirable, um, um, yeah, these uh, undesirable relations. Then Laurens Baus is our third panelist, and um, he's a teacher at the Interdisciplinary Social Sciences, where he teaches uh, mainly in gender and sexuality studies and science studies. And uh, Laurens has published in academic, but also public journals, including, for instance, uh, the Correspondent, the Correspondent on the Sexual Revolution and uh, um, um, Gay Culture, um, has published on many other topics and co-authored a book with Amsterdam University Press on a study on uh, anti-gay violence in Amsterdam. And then finally, but not uh, lastly in a way, uh, I'm going to um, hand over in a moment the mic to uh, Babette Fonchi Fochind, who is both a legal scholar and a poet. And um, she has published in a wide range of, uh, of um, uh, journals, literary or more general uh, um, uh, journals, ranging from the Revisor to the Groene Amsterdammer, the Gids and Elle. And she's been the uh, in-house poet of the online magazine Lilith Mark, and uh, was uh, selected for the writing residency of the Buren and the Slow Writing Lab of the Netherlands uh, Letterenfonds. And her book, her collection, Ploy, uh, just appeared last June in the Geus. Uh, um, so before handing over the mic to, uh, to Babette in a moment, um, uh, I thought it would be good to uh, show you the program. So uh, together we um, decided on three different statements. 
Each statement will be responded to first by a panelist in a brief, a brief response. We have a brief exchange of thoughts here. And then uh, one or two people will be running around with microphones. So we are also hoping for your patience. So you can um, add to the, to the conversation. Uh, but after um, about 20 minutes, uh, I'll have to skip to, uh, to the next statement. And as you can see, we're starting with a kind of a um, historical perspective, a retrospective uh, reflection, and towards the end we're looking to the future. So I'm hoping that maybe you can uh, uh, add to these different perspectives as well. And just to make sure, so sometimes in this context it has been said, well, the university is be tur being turned into a safe space. Um, I think that's a complete exaggeration. What we do in teaching, I have been doing for like decades, maybe, uh, it, maybe uh, at some point Miley can add to that. Um, uh, we've um, often said, well, in particular sessions, like, okay, let's, let's uh, um, recognize that maybe the topic that we are discussing right now will also uh, uh, speak to you as a person, to a particular parts of your identity. And when it comes to that, uh, let's uh, let's take rules like these into consideration. Like let's play the ball, not the player. Um, well, the typical thing. So I just wanted to uh, to re remind ourselves of that. All right, I think enough said. Any questions so far on all this? If not, then let's get on with it. And I'm really happy to ask Babette to take it over here. Please, welcome. Can I use this? Yes? Oh, okay, it's working. Perfect. Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Babette von Gifortjent, and uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Magiel, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm a bit ill, but I don't have corona, so I might be uh, coughing sometimes, uh, so you know. And also, uh, so my um, debut collection of poetry, Ploy, uh, was published uh, last June. Um, and I, uh, I will read from this, though, because uh, I will read some translations. Um, and um, some, of my, some of my poetry has been, uh, three of the four poems that I will be reading today have been translated by uh, Michelle Hutchinson. Um, uh, yeah, I always think it's always it's also important to um, to uh, how do you say it? Sorry, to yeah, exactly that. I've lived abroad for a year, but like, hey, my brain. Um, yeah, acknowledge uh, um, literary translators as well because I I think they don't get enough attention. So, um, and I too will be taking you uh, through time. So I will start with history, um, my gram about my grandma and uh, Cameroon, the country I was born. That's what you call circular economy done well. This morning, I called grandma. She was sitting on her porch, looking out over the courtyard. Under, soft, under the soft Cameroonian sun, the other grandkids baked corn and butter, exactly like grandma taught them. She asked me, if I had received the nuts of the shea, the shea tree and in what light I'd place them so they could last an entire lifetime. I told her that from a yellow ochre bowl I have made by hand, my shea nut looks, over, looks out over the canals where for weeks no one has drowned. And the water, the water is clearer than it has been in a long time. Grandma sighed, the kind of sigh that children reserve for when, they are for, for when they are feeling safe and therefore dare to go out into the world, but don't know yet how unsafe the world can be, can be. Grandma says, in my lifetime I witnessed the raiding of our soil, crops and souls, and all the while remain soft building a whole house and keeping it for my eldest granddaughter to return to. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so the, the second uh, piece is called Well-Intended Pieces of Advice, number one. So, uh, employ. Um, I, um, I divided the, the poems by uh, four um, afdeling subsections. And um, so I try to play with like the advices that Instagram therapists uh, are giving us these days. Um, and um, I loved, um, I think I'm funny, but uh, I, I don't know, like, <laughs> hey, see, it always works. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I'm funny, but I'm very happy that when people read my book, they also see how funny I am so uh, yeah so but but there's actually but the thing is like with my poetry I, it's nice that you laugh because then I there's like it's a sense of emotion so now I have your attention and now I can go like deep you know so um, yeah well-intended pieces of, of advice number one put on your highly sensitive person's playlist and relax consciously ident identify your coping strategies I only ever lie on one side of the bed. Even when I'm alone, I don't want to take up too much space. Breathe. Let go of your negative feelings. Letting go as you exhale usually helps. Challenge yourself today. And I hope uh, you will challenge yourself today uh, by listening to everybody. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Babette. Also, I, I really love this image of like your 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 grandmother's house and how from a safe house, like your uh, explore or the image uh, is about exploring the unsafe world. In a way, I think we are going to do that uh, today as well. And uh, first, I'd like to uh, have, uh, I've sent you these questions, so I'm going to read them because you can't read them. Perhaps uh, oh, it it's not there yet. Let's see. If it works. Yes, it works. So the first statement reads uh, debates about the integration of social justice norms in academic education and research are not uncommon. Uh, sometimes we read like, hey, there are these social justice warriors right now. They want to change uh, and overhaul academic research and education because they now think that we need to include social justice norms in, in our work. Um, being the senior in our uh, company here and a, a very well appreciated senior, I, I, I thought first maybe to ask you to uh, respond to this uh, statement. So, yeah, Martin yeah, has a. I'm not yeah. sure what, what exactly is the statement, but. Um, so I've got it here again. So, does it work? Yeah. Does it work? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what exactly is the statement, but um, the idea that uh, it, it takes a lot of effort and time to introduce social norms in academia is something that I really experienced during my life. Uh, I remembered um, uh, living here in Amsterdam in the 1970s and being part of the feminist movement that we thought that it's just a matter of a second and, average, and the world will be changed. Um, and if you look then at academia, that in the 1980s we started with women's studies in, in uh, academia, which became gender studies. And then after a certain time, there, there were uh, gender studies uh, uh, in almost every university. It declined. And then, fortunately, the government decided that we should have more women in university. And uh, my own university, Erasmus University, uh, decided that there should be diversity officers in each faculty. And I experienced myself how difficult it is to really change the climate in the university and to ask for social justice for women and men, but also uh, the, the, the black and white or different ethnicities and so on. So to be honest, I'm a little bit, what is it, sometimes disappointed how long it takes. And my main, the main lesson that I learned is that you really need to have practical guidelines, practical issues. For example, when I became a diversity officer in my faculty, I decided to become part or a chair of many selection committees because I thought I've been so often the only woman 
in a department or in a meeting or whatever. And I need comrades. I need um, uh, women who support me. And by doing that, there ha there, the, the faculty has really changed. There are many more uh, women. Uh, the diversity is in, 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 et in ethnic or in black and white is actually easy, more easily because a lot of um, students from uh, abroad en uh, enter the faculty. But this male-female thing is really a struggle. And the only thing that helps is having um, volume, having mass, a mass of uh, women who together try to change the academia and introduce all these norms. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks for that, uh, that perspective. Um, we'll uh, continue with uh, the two other responses, and then we'll, as mentioned, then we'll have a brief conversation here before then handing it also over to the audience. So thanks for, for that perspective. Alana. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Is this on? Yeah. Good. Hello, everyone. I feel a bit performative in the setting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, I thought about this question quite a bit at home. Um, and it's almost a rhetorical question, right? So yes, of course, these, these discussions are on the one hand common. They're not uncommon. Um, but I would say it depends on who you're asking. So I would turn this question around a little bit. Um, and I would probably say that academic institutions have been historically institutions that have perpetuated injustice. Right, And that is something that the people who were experiencing these injustices were very astutely aware of. So um, for those who were being excluded, let's say, from these universities or from particular, um, let's say, realms of power within these universities, there, of course, have been discussions because, well, their exclusion was problematic for them. Now, for people who have you know, lived in ignorance of that um, and have had the privilege of not having to experience that, maybe these discussions, right, did not reach them. But historically, um, yes, of course, these, these are relevant discussions for the Netherlands, but also internationally. Um, I'm Dutch, but I studied in the United States where I literally went to university, which used to be called the University in Exile, the new school um, in New York, for those of you who know, yeah, yeah. which is literally where all of the academics went already in you know, the 1920s who were too, I guess today we would call them woke, for the other institutions. Um, so some very specific cases like faculty from Columbia who didn't want to swear an oath to the US, um, but also European scholars who were there literally in exile um, because they were considered too radical. So, you know, those are discussions that have been had for hundred, you know, at least a hundred years. Um, so I think it depends on who you ask. Um, but yeah, so I think at the moment, maybe now these discussions are reaching a broader audience. And also they're being had in a way that we are maybe demanding that they're acted upon versus just had. Um, and like you said, the, you know, there's power in, in numbers. So if you're the only female in a selection committee, maybe it's um, not experienced as a significant voice. Mm -hmm. But if there's suddenly you know, many women in this committee, then suddenly that's maybe considered, you know, quite a significant voice. And maybe that is then by some considered problematic. So I think the question is, you know, for who is this now becoming heard, right? For who is it now becoming um, common and how do they experience that? I think for me, that's my kind of reflection. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, can I? Sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I also have a sort of this double answer, like I see a lot of, uh, it is not uncommon anymore uh, to have these debates, to think about how activism should influence science. We see the social justice movement, um, which is of course stands in a longer tradition of postmodern science, constructivist science, interpretivist science, critical race studies, gender studies, etc. Women's studies, gay and lesbian studies, yeah, so it, it has a long history relatively long, when we look at it in terms of decade, the past couple of decades. 
At the same time, I think also that we are only taking the first baby steps when it comes to this. Yeah, I think we are just at the beginning of waking up to this uh, naive idea that uh, science is somehow objective and that we have objective facts and that we can clearly separate the natural world or the objective world from the cultural world, the social world. Uh, we, of course, also because of philosophers like Bruno Latour, we have seen how we, we know that science is a social process, that facts are being produced, and that in these networks there is politics, there is bias, there is prejudice, there's power. And so I think we are still at the beginning of fully realizing this. Yeah? And I think that doing nothing and holding on to this naive ideal of science is by itself objective is a huge pitfall. And I still think that a lot of the, also the University of Amsterdam is still in that naive idea, especially in the natural sciences, but also in the social sciences. Yeah, and at the same time, I see that the people who try to wake up and to involve activism and politics and a sense of social justice to bring that into the process of science, that they, yeah, they are also taking the first baby step. So I see there also a lot of radicalization, a lot of attempts that yeah, somehow are excessive in my view, yeah, and that somehow hijack the academic debate and that creates certain taboos uh, very, uh, the idea of bringing morality in, in science can also backfire and can create an idea of certain uh, viewpoints are good and others are bad. Yeah, so bringing politics into science needs to be done. I think uh, wokeness shows in a way many, it's inspiring in how it can be done, but also it shows how it can go wrong in my view. So we are just learning. First steps. All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot. In a way, uh, uh, there's even though your contributions uh, have been really different, I think there's a kind of a joint uh, topic, which is like it really depends upon the context, and also uh, even also the, the temporal context that there might be a kind of a, a wave or temp uh, like a pendulum uh, movement. Um, and allowance, uh, what you did was adding a kind of a, uh, also an analytical lens to this, uh, to, the, to these different contexts, um, which is not the, the lens of like a societal context, but also how do we uh, perceive science? Uh, our, uh, uh, some of the responses of the sometimes uh, alarmist responses may be also due to a, a kind of a belief in a very positivist uh, objective. Um, picture of science and being a philosopher of science, teaching philosophy of science at the natural science uh, department. I know that this picture is still alive. I'm, I'm wondering, do the two of you recognize it, that, uh, that there's uh, also kind of an interaction between what happens in society, but also a kind of a self-conception <coughs> of what uh, the university is, what science is? is uh, does that create, does that add to the tension on these social justice uh, claims? Um, maybe I can answer that um, from the perspective of my research. Um, so my research is kind of on the field of um, healthcare and, like you said, biomedicine, where I research particular concepts related to diversity. One of them is race. Um, and I think that this, you know, this kind of holding on to the materiality of that concept is very important for certain users of this concept. So if you're um, a doctor, let's say, um, and you use race as a clinical concept to diagnose patients or to treat patients, then to have someone like myself come in, a social scientist, and problematize that can be very confronting, right? Because from their perspective, often it's like, yeah, but this is just hard science. It's just a fact. Um, and that takes kind of, it takes a while. Um, and from a science and technology perspective, of course, we're constantly looking at how society is shaping science. But, you know, from, I can, I'm also very sympathetic to people who have to make life and death situations based on science, that they need to feel like science is, in fact, 
um, you know, producing facts in this more positivistic sense. So um, I think it's very careful, um, and we have to be very careful, let's say, in how we bring this message um, and people who want to hold on to more of a positivistic perspective of science and also to do that from a place where we really think of, okay, but what, what, uh, what does it mean for them to then accept, you know, um, the social sh shaping of science? Of course, it's very easy to say, well, you know, all of these facts are constructed um, uh, um, uh, you know, read uh, Latour's work, um, you know, just because something is gaining in reality and science doesn't necessarily mean that it's factual. Or, you know, of course you can tell them there's multiple representations of the world, material semiotics can analyze this and so forth. But I think we also have to look at the use of that science. Um, so I don't know if that's, that's from my field a very particular insight into that debate. Uh, yeah. I think so. Uh, from there, I think, uh, uh, Marley, you're also a medical doctor. Um, so, I you, was. so yeah, you were. I'm, oh, right. I'm not allowed not, to say that, that I'm still. Well, here, I didn't in this context, long okay. In this context, <laughs> well, you've got an MD, um, and um, if if so, uh, just before you mentioned like the decades uh, ago, how in the, also during feminist claims, etc., how how difficult uh, the process and tiresome the process was. Now, um, since the 1970s, these critics of science have become much more common. Um, do they, has that changed, in your perception, the discussion on these uh, social justice claims within academia? That we are now, I think many of us are more aware of the social influences, societal influences on the production of knowledge. Has that made these discussions about moral claims in science easier, or are they two completely different arenas? It's, it's very hard to say. Um, the strange thing is that the more objective uh, the science practice is, mm -hmm. the more easy it is for, for women and for all, all other, yeah, it's not minorities, what is it? Mm -hmm. uh, people, the diverse people to enter. The, uh, so mm -hmm. it's more easy, the more objective a field is. So in biology, for example, but also in medicine, it's quite easy for women to enter. Whereas in my field, in philosophy, it's very hard for women, and especially, I mean, the analytical, more objective branch of philosophy is more easy to, uh, to be entered than the continental philosophy. And I remember uh, one uh, conference where I was a speaker, and the male, and it was about uh, gender and diversity issues, and a male professor uh, came to me and said, he was, he was quite big, and he said, Marty, do you know what's the problem in philosophy? You have males who are big and who convince, who, are, who easily know how to persuade you, and you have small women. And um, it makes clear that uh, this more, what is it, uh, male power or the physical presence or what you look like, your appearance, um, has a, a, a more impact the less objective the scientific branch is. And that, for me, is very difficult. I, of course, know the work of Latour, of Donna Haraway, of um, Sandra Harding, and, and so on, about objectivity of science, but it doesn't help uh, this, this discussions to really open the university and uh, give access to everyone and to, to not only give access but also to help people to perform in this, the, the same way, to have an equal uh, option to perform uh, similarly. Right, so in a sense, even in the field, like in, in philosophy, where many of these thoughts are being yeah, philosophy developed. Is, philosophy is oh. the, 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 the most terrible. Yeah, philosophy is the most in, terrible. In, Actually, there has been, yeah. so I think there are several philosophers here, and also uh, I've seen several colleagues in the room. Um, maybe some of you know that there has been this research um, where uh, scholars of different fields have been asked, like, to what extent do you feel that being excellent in your field depends upon a natural gift, a natural talent? And there's a range of uh, uh, disciplines where people thought, no, it's a matter of training and you know, being a good student. 
And then there is a, sub, a set of disciplines that believe in a natural talent, and philosophy is the worst. Yeah. Yeah. So it's incredible, I think, for many of us here. Um, but uh, as, as you mentioned, so in a way, having these lessons uh, on, uh, on the societal impact um, still don't really play out also in, in these human interactions. And that's sometimes the authority of, 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 of males or the self. Um, self-proclaimed authority over ways here. Um, does it, so hearing the responses of Alana and Marley on, on, on uh, also this idea of it has to do also with the nature or our belief in the nature of science, does that sound familiar to you? Uh, yeah, I absolutely think so. So I think, again, like we uh, have to, we, I really think that we are in the beginning of a huge scientific revolution where we come to think radically different w about what a scientific fact is. I think this will also overturn a societal order because I think the idea of objective objectivity is very dominant in society. So uh, I see that uh, discussions about um, how can we integrate a more, or principles of justice into science um, will also have, will relate to this sort of scientific revolution, I think. And so for me, it is a question, how can we open up science? How can we make it more democratic? How can we make it more just? How can we uh, be sensitive to the power systems? How can we recognize patriarchy, whiteness in the University of Amsterdam and other institutions? How do we open it up without installing a new system of oppression. Yeah, so this is, I think, uh, definitely, yeah. Okay, well, uh, um, we, we, this raises a whole heap. I'm, I'm moderating, so I'm not going to directly uh, discuss this, but it uh, opens up uh, uh, another uh, topic, like whether we are indeed looking at this uh, scientific revolution. Let's, I'm going to hand over the microphone to, uh, to our audience. But let's try, maybe we're not going to discuss like whether there's a scientific revolution, but let's try to um, uh, particularly focus on this interaction between social justice or societal norms and what we are doing in academia, in the production of science and knowledge. I think, um, yeah, there's one microphone here. So um, why don't you raise your hand? I've got, I'm here and at a pilot uh, position, so I can easily find you and ask uh, Vincent to uh, approach you. So who'd like to uh, add here? We were, in a way, expecting many hot... <laughs> Please, yes. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Someone's got to get the ball rolling. Um, it's actually just a response to Mali that uh, in my very limited relative to yours, four-year experience, both at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and the University of Amsterdam in the history departments at least, that uh, male-female diversity was kind of slightly better taken care of than racial or ethnic diversity, and that there was a degree of self-congratulation. We have achieved diversity because look, we have some white women in the room uh, that I found very discomforting actually, and so I would kind of question gently question the idea that that diversity is going to take care of itself by bringing in people from other countries. I think maybe that's true in your field, but it's not something that we should kind of just accept without examining. Right, so in a way, if I, if I can, uh, you're asking or you're raising in a way two uh, questions or two remarks. One is that taking care of the gender disbalance uh, doesn't automatically lead to including other dimensions of diversity. And then the uh, other uh, uh, remark you're making is that internationalization is not really the same as increasing uh, yeah. diversity, as we have many internationals being from more or less the same constituency as we Thanks. Thanks. So, Marley, you were asked, but maybe others want to weigh in as well. But uh, why don't you respond yeah, first to this? I, th I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, I don't know about the University of Amsterdam, but Erasmus University got this task from uh, the, the board of the university as and uh, number one priority was to uh, take care of more women in academia. And then second 
goal. And of course, you all know that if the first goal is, is attained, then the, 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 the chances are high that the second uh, one will never uh, come up again. Uh, so the second goal is indeed uh, this is hardly taken and, and uh, paid attention to. And um, uh, to be honest, uh, I'm still very anxious that this um, this timely what is it this this uh, upgrading of more women in the academia will continue because I sometimes see that it's going back again and in the second goal there, there there's hardly anything achieved and especially not if you look at um, uh, persons living in in Rotterdam who are uh, the first generation students and if it's only the international elite entering our, our university and leaving it within a couple of years, there's in, actually nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. So I, I totally agree with your concern here. Yeah. An allowance, anything to add here? So maybe I can mention then, since you uh, mentioned, like at the University of Amsterdam, um, Similarly, gender, the gender disbalance is, is, addre is addressed for a couple of years or even decades uh, right now. And there are also like targets. Uh, so for instance, female professors should be uh, about a third uh, um, around this time. But by now, uh, the University of Amsterdam, as many others, have uh, only reached about 25%. Uh, but um, I can tell you from my experience also as a faculty of science diversity officer a couple of years, that gender disbalance was easily uh, recognized by my colleagues and the dean, etc., because you can measure that. That's, it's relatively easy uh, to measure. We have the data also. Um, but as soon as I pointed out, OK, now maybe we're making some progress here. How about the other categories of diversity? Then it raised a whole range of issues, like what is the threshold? What population should we take as the kind of a the measurement, the measure stick, uh, is it international or just the Amsterdam uh, youth, etc. So there's a whole uh, range of other topics, including how to uh, acquire data, which I'm also struggling right now at the, at the Maagdijk here. So thanks, yeah. Uh, and, and with, again, maybe well, the microphone, uh, as with the internationalization, this issue uh, that Marley has confirmed is raised here as well. Please. Hi. Um, from a Latin America point of view, I was thinking um, that uh, I think social justice norms have always or have for years been part of academia um, discussions and education. Um, the problem is reverse. It's um, that they were trapped into it after the dictatorships in the 20th century. Um, and I have to uh, make clear that I'm not a huge fan of Pierre Bourdieu, but he has a good essay that is called, well, he has many good things, but he has an essay that I like that is called Scholarship with Commitment. Um, and he discusses the separation of academia and activism, and especially in, 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 in the context of Latin America. Um, and I think that because this discussion of social norms have, have for years, at least in the Latin America countries, and I think in other contexts too, have been trapped in academia, they cannot threaten the status quo of anything, of the state especially. So I think that uh, you know, breaking that bridge between academia and activism is what is causing so many people to be so uncomfortable, because it's not only a matter of discussing social justice, it's acting upon it. And that we don't like in academia because we think that's not um, academic enough. So, so when you're, just uh, for clarification, when you're mentioning like it's being trapped in academia, you mean it's like caught there and if it's is, no longer exported into society? Well, no, it's, it's not acting upon it. I mean, one, one thing is to discuss, for instance, um, you know, moral issues within human genome editing, for instance, right? But the other thing, very, a very different thing will be to act upon it, not as academics, but not only as academics, but also um, as an activist. So, for instance, if we look at the way that activists and academics have collaborated in the past, it's a very, very small collaboration because it's a difficult collaboration because academics and activists of social justice see themselves as a, in a separate, different world. Mm -hmm. So, I think that the, the, main, um, the main challenge here is to break that di uh, divide. 
and to understand that it's basically an imaginary divide and that if we trap discussions of social justice within our academic rigorousness and um, if we trap it in academic journals and books and we don't act upon it um, as activists slash academics, then you know we it's not really doing nothing but just um, enriching our academic egos, I think. Thanks. Thanks. I would like to uh, respond to that. Uh, this, this. No, I think that's definitely, um, I agree with you. I think this is definitely kind of a, um, yeah, the, a good warning. But I also think we can learn a lot from groups who have been able to bridge this. Because if we look, um, going back to, you know, the scholars of the Harlem Renaissance, mm -hmm. they've always been able to bridge that. Um, I just returned from the Afro-Europeans conference at the Free University in, in um, Brussels. Um, and it has, from the beginning, a lot of Afro-European European scholars have had both those hats on, right? As an activist, I don't know if they use this word, but people trying to kind of implement actual social change or policy change, but also as scholars. But I think one of the things that a lot of people who have those different hats um, struggle with, um, especially within the Dutch setting, is that saying that someone is an activist is a direct, um, I guess you could say, invalidation of them as scientists. Yes. So you, so for me, if someone says to me, "You're an activist," this is an insult mm -hmm. to me as a scientist, because already a lot of the work that people do is said, "Oh, but it, this is." you know, political correctness, it's not science. So I think that it's also kind of very difficult to do this um, because, uh, yeah, uh, and it, it, it's also kind of, in, like you're saying, it invalidates a lot of, you know, ways of doing work that is outside of particularly the academic setting. Um, but I do think there's a lot to be learned from scholars in places who have been able to do that. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if I agree 100%. Um, but I think this also has to do with the institutions, mm -hmm. right? You know, we have all of this new, uh, new of our dating and all this stuff about how do we um, evaluate the work that we do as scientists. And this should, I think, be there should be more room for this type of stuff and not under like valorization chapters in your PhD kind of thing. I don't know if you want to say yeah, that. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> yeah, I also really recognize it that it's a real often seen as a disqualification for you as a scientist if you do activist work. And I think this is very important to tackle. Um, also, again, challenging the idea that we can separate this whole thing, politics and, and, and science, it's inseparable. And I also would like to go, like, if there are best practices, like you mentioned, of institutions or groups that have succeeded in bridging that, that would be very interesting to look at. Uh, because I think where we need to go to is to, as science, also to recognize that our science production, the production of knowledge, will increase its quality if we become more societally involved, if we become more politically woke. Yeah? So we need to integrate certain yeah, sort of awareness of, of politics in our practices of science um, without that being seen as a disqualification. And I think, I'm not naive about that. I think we are very far away removed from that yet still. There is still this very dominant view of proper science that is neutral, objective, that is somehow magically a one-to-one -one representation of objective reality. And I think this is such stubborn, deeply rooted cultural beliefs, a belief system that we're still, yeah, it's, it's still very powerful. Powerful, and in a way, in many cases, I think, like self-contradicting. I, I think how many scientists, certainly like social scientists, but even natural scientists are aware of the fact that even setting a research agenda and deciding to spend your money on this project and not another one, has also a societal impact. Uh, but I'm, I'm really a little bit puzzled, but maybe that's for, for after, um, after the program. So let's uh, uh, just to remind you, we'll um, 
um, have uh, uh, like 45 more minutes for the next two statements and uh, uh, poetry, so we'll continue. But I just wanted to uh, mention that um, the University of Amsterdam, just like many other uh, universities in the Netherlands, are being more and more involved in community service learning for the students. And a lot of inspiration comes from actually from Latin American experiences with uh, participatory action research, like the work of Paulo Freire. So I'm really um, interested to hear more about your disappointments uh, about the Latin American uh, experiences with that. But that may be for a later moment. Um, it's time again for some poetry uh, to um, um, have our Im imagination and maybe our emotions uh, stirred in another uh, way. So um, I think we can maybe now um, remain seated here, but uh, Babette, I'd like to uh, invite you again to the, to the stage. Listen careful to Hi again. Hi again. <laughs> okay, so um, I have two more pieces, and now uh, we're more into um, in now, now we're in um, in the now. <laughs> Next, we're going to the future. Um, but I hope that will actually not be our future, the last poem. Um, and this poem that I'm going to, uh, the third poem that I'm going to read is called This Captcha Code is not designed to be cracked. And uh, I see a lot of uh, young people, relatively young people in the room. So I think you all might know what a CAPTCHA code is, but for the people that don't know, it's um, the box with letters and numbers that you need to fill in when you enter a website to show that you're not a robot, that you're human. And um, well, this CAPTCHA code is not designed to be cracked. You come out of the closet, a transparent virtual storage space that exists only in the mind of dated computer programs. Inside the chat room, you and your mother send each other emojis with waterfall cheeks, red faces and clouds issuing from noses and ears. The voice memo explaining why sexual, or sexual orientation is not a choice doesn't come in at her frequency. The connection is lost. She is not programmed to unconditionally love the person behind the screen, even though, even though she thought up both your genes and the pixels. Leave this field empty to prove you are not a homo hacker. Click on all the pictures containing a family so you will know what you have lost when you answer the control question incorrectly. There is no filter to make the color scheme of anger and sadness for digital rejection lighter. The events that created this pattern are retained in cache files. Cookies that are accepted analyze feelings, especially when you don't expect it. You should have read the terms and conditions. Google remembers the emptiness that you kept on searching for where to buy mothers in permanent form. The algorithm creeps, creeps into desires through typing fingers. The mother you never had appears in adverts and dreams. She will be delivered on Friday. Please make sure you're home. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I always like to, uh, and I asked um, uh, the organization today, Melton, to, to not film me, or at least if you film me, then cut me out of, uh, of the thing uh, when, uh, when it's on the internet. Because I think um, with Corona, it's, it's, um, it's a positive thing eh? that, that people can rewatch stuff or watch it from, from home. And it's a positive thing that we can do multiple things at, at, at time, you know, not a positive thing, you know, <laughs> people should also rest. Um, but, um, and the reason why I ask that is because I like when things are slow and art is also sometimes it's nice when it's slow and also because poetry is, is intimate to me. So, um, yeah, thank you for, uh, for respecting that. And thank you for making me feel, um, very safe and um, comfortable, actually, uh, for being here today. Thank you. Yeah. 
So the last poem is uh, uh, called For When Things Get Too Hot Here. Um, and uh, I would say I'm a... Uh, I'm a soft, uh, soft, act soft activist. No, I would, I, I'm just a soft person. So, uh, uh, <laughs> um, but I try also to. I also try to make change in my in my own way. I, I believe that everybody can do that, and maybe also wants to do it. Um, and I think this is one of like the the most political poems, explicitly explicit political poems in my uh, in my. Um, uh, poetry collection, and you will see that it's not even that that political. So hey, <laughs> for for when things get too hot here, I send a golden record into space, on which I explain to extraterrestrial beings what species I am. See it as a black box of human civilization, with natural sounds, the surf, the song of a nightingale. The chorus of Britney Spears, I'm not a girl, not yet a woman. An, expl an exploding hand grenade. An elephant's last groan as its ducks are cut off. I also send pictures of human anatomy. A side view of a creature with both breasts and descendant tes and descended testicles. On another record, a premature baby with an abnormal, abnormal, uh, <laughs> abnormal, oh, uh, Jesus, abnormality, <laughs> that word, <laughs> which is the wrong color genit, oh, Jesus, the wrong color genital, oh, Jesus, I can't even read it, what is this? Can I do it in Netherlands? I'm doing it in Netherlands, sorry. I'm not even my own gedicht on the best. I don't want to have it. Okay, for all that it's called to be Ik stuur een gouden platenruimte in, waarop ik buiten naar zijn beschavingen uitleg wat voor een soort ik ben. Zie het als een black box van de menselijke beschaving. Met natuurlijke geluiden. De branding, het gezang van een nachtegaal. Het refrein van Britney Spears, I'm not a girl, not yet a woman. Een ontploffende handgranaat. De laatste kreun van een olifant als zijn slagtanden worden afgesneden. Ook stuur ik plaatjes van de menselijke anatomie. In zij aan zicht van een schepsel met zowel borsten als ingedaalde testicles. Op een ander plaatje een vroeggeborene met als afwijking de verkeerd genetisch gemodificeerde kleur ogen. Verder bevat de plaat gelukwensen in 55 talen, waaronder het Nederlands. Ik doe iedereen de hartelijke groetjes... En vraag of ik op een dag welkom ben zonder het afleggen van een inburgeringsexamen. Dank je wel. Dank je. Dank je wel, uh, dank je wel, Babette. Uh, ja. uh, in zekere zin zijn we allemaal hier bezig met een soort inburgeringsexamen in een nieuwe, misschien een nieuwe fase van het denken over, over kennis en, uh, en moraal. Uh, en sturen we ook een gouden plaat de wereld in. Uh, dat doen we nu aan de hand van deze tweede stelling. Uh, we gaan weer zo meteen eerst aan de panelleden uh, vragen om daar kort op te reageren. Uh, en dan op een gegeven moment komt u natuurlijk ook weer aan het Ik, oh, sorry. I didn't get that. Sorry. It's just like an anchor, right. Apologies. Um, so... Um, Again, this is a second of third statements, and uh, I'll ask the panelists briefly to respond to that, have a brief discussion here, and then uh, you'll get your chance as well to weigh in. And the second statement reads, wokeism and counter culture threaten the free exchange and development of ideas in academia. Um, so now we are getting, I think, to the, what is often uh, defined as the essence of the, of the debate about wokeism and counter culture, like we're, we're uh, considering this as a threat to academic freedom or the academic uh, well, function in a way. Um, so now I'd, uh, last, uh, I'd like to ask first Alana, then yeah. Laurence, and then Mar uh, Marley to respond to this. Uh, briefly. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, so indeed, I, I mean, I think I have to first say what I, how I understand cancel culture and wokeism to then say if it's a threat to academic um, freedom and development. 
um, of ideas in academia. So to me, cancel culture is a really poor institutional um, response to um, moments well, of friction or discussion. So if the response to um, a debate is to then kind of take away the debate by taking away groups that oppose each other, then I would say, well, yes, this would be kind of a poor thing to do in science for scientific discussions. Now, I think that's something very different than saying that maybe the set of scientific knowledge or the set of facts that might have been used in a particular field are in need of updating. And therefore, let's say, you know, the figureheads within a field who might have been perpetuating that are no longer welcome. Um, so let's take um, psychiatry and the, uh, the kind of the, the d diagnosis that homosexuality was a disease. We don't talk about that as saying like, oh, that's cancel culture. No. Obviously, we talk about that as saying, well, the removal of that as a classified um, um, disease is right, kind of updating our understanding of science, which is a good thing. Um, so, I mean, updating, you know, the kind of the set of knowledge and facts that we use based on new insights, I think, is exactly what science is about. So, we should be doing that. Although, of course, this is quite difficult for those who are being updated, which is something else. Um, cancel culture, which I see as kind of a knee-jerk reaction by institutions in order to not truly have to engage in a debate, I think is very poor kind of, you know, institutional response. Um, and this happens quite a bit. So, you know, disinviting guests for something um, and just canceling entire events or courses or whatever it is, I mean, th I think that's a poor response because it's a moment where you miss having an actual debate, right, about something. Now, this idea of um, free exchange, I think, also doesn't exist, right? So there, it's not like there was a space in which there was a free exchange, no. I mean, there's always... Um, kind of, you know, ways in which particular topics are talked about. Um, if we look at the work, for instance, of Kwame Namako and Philomena Essed, they specifically analyze ethnic um, studies in the Netherlands and migration studies and show very clearly that, you know, there was, in the years that they were coming up, many things that were just, there wasn't room for that, right? Um, so I think that now what's happening is that there's room being creative, created for more diverse voices in many different fields, and that this changes the playing field of who has you know, a dominant voice in a particular debate. Um, and I think that for those who are used to not being challenged in that way, that they experience that as you know, a lack of free exchange and, and being canceled and things like that. Now, of course, I think we can say that certain individuals might have been effectively literally canceled, a course or a lecture or something like that. But like I said, to me, that's a very uh, inadequate institutional response to um, you know, there being kind of friction in a particular class or around an event. So in short, I would say no. Um, and wokeism, I really, yeah, I'm, I, I don't really see how that would uh, affect any of this. So, for, yeah, I think I'll keep it to kind of the cancel culture, since that's what a lot of people are concerned about. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think you can hand over to Lawrence this time. Yes. So, um, so for me, like, I see this uh, scientific institution functioning as if it's uh, in an illusion uh, that the science can be neutral. I think this is dangerous. Yeah? So because then we don't see how power is used and abused in science. And then also we don't see how important a democratic science is for the current world. The world is in, in a lot of despair, a lot of crisis. There's huge inequalities, huge challenges when it comes to 
our relationship with the natural world, for example. So we need a more activist science, in my view. For me, it is not an option to do nothing. And I see this old science that dresses up as if it can be neutral and objective as a huge danger. At the same time, then when I wokeism, when I see wokeism, I also am ambiguous to, to that. Um, I see this as some parts very interesting best practices in how you can integrate activism into science. But also I see some parts derailing and I'm also very worried about it. Yeah? So I see also extremism on that side, also dangerous developments. And what I'm afraid of is that wokeism in some aspects can is be, uh, be, uh, this old monster of a university that is authoritarian, explaining the world how things should be, but then now dressed up as in a sort of diversity police outfit, telling the world what sh what's right, what's wrong, what's good to think, what's bad to think. Yeah, so I also see that danger. But let me, uh, just more practically, I have been a teacher in the summer schools of the University of Amsterdam and already <laughs> for 15 years. And very quickly, I got into touch with especially American students from social justice departments in American campuses. They came to University of Amsterdam, they were in my classrooms, and they were woke, and I was not. And I learned so much from it. It was tough, because they really confront me. Eh? Like, the stu these students, they are not shy. Uh, so they really say, okay, this curriculum is repressive, you have your bias, you are create an unsafe space, you are you have internalized whiteness. And I was like, whoa, what's this, you know? So uh, for me, it was very tough to deal with that in the beginning. This was, I think, 15, 10 years ago. But it, it helped me a lot. And it's not easy uh, to look in the mirror that woke students gave me. It's not easy because you see a monster. I saw a monster I had to come to terms with. Yeah? So uh, then at the same time, I also saw amongst these students, especially because they thought, oh, we are now successful in sort of disrupting the academic system. Also, some students started to abuse it, not often consciously, but okay, but they claimed the moral high ground, they claimed they, they like to destabilize the teacher, to take the floor, I saw a lot of ego, I saw a lot of, uh, yeah, wrong elements in it as well. Yeah, and some aspects that were not supposed to be debated, wrong and, and good opinions, no genuine debate anymore. So that really, um, yeah, sort of made me aware over the years, I've been working a lot, like what can I integrate from wokeism and what do I see as dangerous? Yeah, and I also see extremism there. I also see, uh, for example, I work in gender and sexuality and I see a lot of woke students that are attacking the whole idea of a gender binary, that there is no such thing as the distinction between masculine and feminine. I'm an interdisciplinary scientist. I not only work with Judith Butler, who sees everything as a performance, as a construction. I also work with queer evolutionary bi biology. I also work with Jungian psychology, uh, where there is a very important concept, uh, the masculine and the feminine. And even though uh, a lot of these disciplines need to be queered up, still the distinction itself is, according to me, not part of heteronormativity and of, of repression, of gender repression. We can make a distinction between the masculine and the feminine without being heteronormative, without being sexist. And when I make this point, I'm often cancelled, also at the University of Amsterdam, which leads literally to courses taken away, to positions taken away, to colleagues who have certain ideas about me, and that is difficult for me. Yeah? So that also touches me in my everyday work. I really am struggling with this. Like, how can I be true to my ideas, which is nuanced, some part about wokeism I love, and some I think is really dangerous. But when I express it, I experience uh, how narrow the debate can be. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Marty, your response. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> I, to be honest, I really don't know what cancel culture and wokeism is. 
because it's a name and it's homogenizing all the people, the complexity of groups and people who are involved in trying to change the society and university. And I very often think it's a term invented by conservative groups, conservative parties who want to discredit um, all the people who are fighting for a social change. And social change is only possible, or almost only possible, uh, when there is a, an avant-garde, a, a group who runs uh, in front of everyone and who is going faster than most people go, and who really want a radical change. And this radicalism is part of a social movement who wants to change something. And if I look back, for example, at, at the, the Purple September here in Amsterdam, which was the most radical group of lesbians who wanted to change uh, the, the male-female relationships, uh, they were discredited as, as being, what is it, uh, too male, too, uh, too radical, too whatever. Mm. They were harder words, but fortunately I can't remember them anymore. Um, so, and that's what's happening today too, that people are discredited because they are too radical. Or, whereas I think, well, we are in a position, where we're in a situation where um, things are really changing due to globalization. The, 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 the students entering uh, university are much more diverse than when I started studying. And fortunately, they are uh, uh, brave enough and have enough courage to really want to make a change. And uh, only discredit them is, is, I would say, it's terrible, and we shouldn't accept it. I mean, wake up. Um, is it, what is it, Bob Marley, or what is it? Uh, stand up, wake up for your rights. Wake up, stand up for your rights, it is. Or uh, wake up, sister black queen. There are so many songs that if you want to change something, wake up and try to change it, do something. And that doesn't mean that activism is always good, because people can also have terrible ideas. But being open in to, to discuss it, and also as a, as a professor, I mean, my last course was, uh, no, one, uh, the last, uh, before my last one, was about the late work of Michel Foucault, with a lot of sexuality and a lot about homosexuality and um, ideas uh, uh, originating in uh, Roman and Greek culture and also having relation, uh, old men having relationships with younger uh, men. And I saw that the students had really troubles uh, discussing these issues. Whereas in the 1970s, in the 1980s, it was quite normal to discuss this open uh, view of Foucault on sexuality. And I thought, well, OK, uh, society has changed. <clears throat> it might be more difficult to be a teacher and having these critical reactions on Foucault than uh, 30 years ago. But that's interesting. That's science. That you should be open uh, to discuss everything. And if, as a university, you have to weigh uh, between offending people or having a, a what is it, a 100% uh, free a debate, I would say it, it's crazy if you only go, go for the free opinion. It's always important that, that, that people are not in, offended. And if you discriminate people or um, you, you, you act as a sexist or whatever, it's, I would say you have, as a university, you have all right to say, well, sorry, but this, these people are not welcome. You're offending the population of students that is uh, working and student, studying here. Right, so I, I hear quite some, like some, some ambivalence in a way, right? So to, to a large extent, I hear all, all three of you embracing part of this activism and also the claims, but also sometimes uh, being somewhat wary about uh, the, maybe the, 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 uh, the radical extreme I'm, I'm or not, responses. Not really, I'm that not really is, afraid uh, of this radicalism. No. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> instead of uh, actually also, uh, because I'm also uh, looking forward to a third statement, I, I thought let's immediately uh, throw in or invite, I have to say, invite the audience to uh, contribute. Yes, please. There's someone over there, all the way over there. Um, Hello. Um, I'd like to ask a question from a more analytical perspective. 
So as per my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, academic exchange has never truly been free in the sense that we've had peer review practices being put in place in the late 20th century and so on and so forth. Um, so I'd like to use the example of psychology in that sense, where you've seen a lot of theories come up out um, like they were uncensored and people were just putting forward ideas and so on and so forth. But then later on in the previous century, you see uh, institutions like the APA or the BPS, uh, which put in these guidelines and they put in these uh, safety protocols and that kind of thing. So a lot of the peer review practices, not just in psychology, but in a lot of social sciences in general, you see um, a clause for socially sensitive research, right? So my question to you is, how do you see vocism and cancel culture impact the academic peer review process? And how does that limit or liberate uh, the development of ideas in academia? Yeah. All right, thanks. That's really an interesting uh, uh, question. Let me uh, briefly, uh, before uh, asking, inviting the panelists to, to weigh in here. So uh, there's generally kind of a distinction uh, made between the freedom of uh, speech, uh, where more or less you can uh, well, uh, speak to your heart and, and, and express any thought and idea. Academic freedom is in a way even larger. On the other hand, there are restrictions, which the word academic refers to. So you're, uh, you're required to apply academic standards like rational argumentation, uh, uh, showing evidence, etc. So there's a, quite a distinction between the two. But I think in a way your question asks, like, is this really a strict distinction? Because these academic standards, like we're using in peer review, for instance, they're also under scrutiny on the critique, sometimes under under attack. So um, how, how would you respond to, to this, like, is the academic freedom, which presupposes academic standards, do you feel that uh, these, these are, like, generally embraced, or do we need also to update these to, in, in a way, um, maybe apply, like, arguments from wokeism to the academic process itself? Um, speaking maybe from the field that I'm most familiar with, um, I would say that the academic freedom was more kind of a, a, a negative right, if you will. So if you look at um, the, well, the people who might be labeled woke in terms of health research and medicine, they're, they're very much pointing to um, the exclusion of groups in medical research and biomedicine. So you might say that there was an academic freedom for many, many years um, to just exclude women, right, from biomedical research, to exclude all types of diversity from biomedical research. And indeed, what you see is the um, funders of, of scientific research, but also um, journals are kind of saying, well, yeah, you don't really have the freedom to just, you know, be biased and exclude these groups anymore. So they have all kinds of um, guidelines to make sure that those groups are in included. Um, but I do think it's not, um, from my experience, being um, in committees that evaluate um, um, grant proposals, um, but also as an author who goes through those same kind of, uh, um, well, processes, a lot of it ends up being kind of ticking the box. You know, have you considered disenfranchised groups, blah, da, 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 right, in the research? Um, so, yeah, I think that there's definitely kind of been some institutionalization of attention for social justice, at least in the fields that I'm familiar with. But I don't know how, um, if this also has an impact on the quality of the research and kind of the applicab applicability of, for instance, biomedical knowledge on a broader population. Um, a lot of it is kind of what uh, Sara Ahmed would call happy diversity, you know, um, not really getting to the heart of the, the issue. That's my experience. You'd like to, yeah, uh, to add to yeah, that? I, yeah, I, I agree with that. The, 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 I would say that also the uh, criteria of what good science is are, are, are changing. If you look in the Netherlands, that the, 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 the Royal 
Academy for the Sciences, as, together with the Dutch uh, funding organization, has changed the criteria, it's, it's called uh, recognition and valuing, uh, in order to diversify what scientific practice is. And of course it has to do, um, has to um, um, uh, not submit, but uh, it, it ha there, there are certain uh, regulations and certain standards for what science is, but even then there is so much diversity. If you only look at philosophy, in the philosophy that at this moment there is a huge debate on what exactly is the philosophical uh, canon, canon, um, and should we only, uh, uh, what has happened uh, until now, uh, look at male philosophers until the 20th century, or should we include uh, female philosophers, or, which is also an opsy, should we uh, start uh, in, in a new way and uh, define philosophy in a completely different way and not only looking at old males. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a changing situation and I'm, to be honest, I'm very glad with that because I think science is a living organism, it's changing all the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to mention my, my own field, uh, which is partly the philosophy of cognitive neuroscience. Uh, for maybe only the last 10 years, culture has been really recognized as, a, as an important dimension. Whereas for a long time, the idea was, well, the, our brains have been evolved for millions of years. So culture has no impact on these processes, maybe in, in language processing. So indeed, here again, we see that, uh, that the science itself is very slow in responding to changes. Sometimes it does respond, but maybe not always uh, fast enough. Can uh, I, can I yes, say, please. Uh, yeah, sure. yeah, if, if you take uh, Donna Haraway's view, the, uh, serious, that the, the perspective of the scientist has an, a large impact on what, what science is or what objectivity is, then I would say that the entrance of a diversity of mm. students will also, have, uh, will also affect the contents and outcomes of science. Right, yeah. certainly, yeah. Any, so um, we would have time for one question on this, and then we'll spend the last 50 minutes on, on the third statement, looking ahead to the future. But can I offer the mic to anyone? Well, if not, let's jump to the future. Then. Right, just at the, almost the knock of the hammer. <laughs> Please. Um, yeah, about the, well, I will talk about my French perspective because I'm an next year student here in the University of Amsterdam. Um, in France, wokeism and cancel culture has been used uh, by, well, it was not exactly wokeism, but it became, but it was another word, maybe you heard about it, it was Islamo-Gauchism, which is the contraction between a leftist and an Islamist. And it was used by the government, mostly, and by the ministry, uh, the, the minister of higher education, to, well, to organize like a witch hunt into universities and to say, well, what you're studying, it's not real science. But it was by the government. The point is, it was by the government. And in my, I understand what you said about the students, the American students, and about some, maybe some excess of their, I don't know, believings and practice, etc. But in my point of view, I think it's more anti-wokeism which is more a threat to the friction and development of ideas in academia, because in, like you said in the previous part of the, this conversation, there were always debates in academic fields, and now the politics is trying to, well, reduce them because it's, well, in France it's used because it's like a complicity with terrorism, but it's very particular to France. Maybe, I don't know, in the Netherlands or in the United States, but. Now, I think the strategy is more on anti-wokeism than wokeism. Thanks. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for that. And maybe I, uh, from the Dutch uh, uh, perspective, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, our Minister of uh, Justice and Security um, in a lecture, this whole lecture, um, mentioned different threats to democracy, and wokeism was one of them. So I think uh, the, uh, the first even, right. So. Um, 
Yes, Laurens, please. So I think it's an interesting story, and I see it also happening here in Holland, so that we see that the far right uses wokeism to discredit the entire diversity p uh, policy programs or uh, any effort to work on diversity and inclusion. So they really make a caricature of it. Yeah? But at the same time, that doesn't mean that wokeism is not a problem. I find it very unsatisfactory to say, oh, this is just a trick by the far right and we have nothing to be afraid of or to be ashamed of or to be worried about because everything is going well. I think, uh, have a look at the gender and sexuality department here at the University of Amsterdam, I think this is seriously radicalizing at the moment. I think there are students and staff being recruited in a far left extremist agenda that is just a danger to society and that is sold as science. Yeah, so this can also happen and it's happening under our eyes and I am disappointed in the sort of critical capacity of a lot of my colleagues who are very inclined to think in duality, the danger is in the far right, and they see how the far right is abusing eh, the critique on wokeism to discredit everything related to diversity, but they cannot look to themselves yeah, and to what extent this activist agenda is also derailing. It's happening under our eyes, and I'm extremely concerned, and I uh, yeah, think we cannot be silent about it. I'm very curious, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I find this very interesting, because this is not at all my experience. So I'm, um, I'm curious what exactly this extremist agenda is, what it's pushing for, and how it's a, a threat to society. Like what are, what's happening that is such a threat or why is it so extreme? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to explain because then we have to go into depth into what's going on into the politics. But I see it's an authoritarian system. Again, a system of fear that has a certain truth is being sold as the proper truth and the truth that we all have to think. For example, about gender, about sexuality, about pronouns, about the, the, which terms to use. And all other positions are discredited as bigot. And even when you come with scientifically funded uh, uh, arguments, yeah, that then you're still being discredited. And in what I think in the core is the problem, is, and it is not a new problem at all, is that postmodernism and constructivism, it's a fantastic uh, stream of science and stream of thinking because we needed the critique on essentialism. But constructivism can also derail. It can portray a picture of society and of the world as if it is totally makeable, as if we can do whatever we want. We can deconstruct, reconstruct, undo, redo, uh, everything we like, and there is, I think it's a, a ridiculizing of, of a sort of cosmic order, and I think that's dangerous. Yeah? In, in a, yeah. uh, uh, is it uh, maybe just uh, t trying to, to clarify also to help uh, uh, Alana's question being answered? Um, are you perhaps also referring, I, I'm thinking of a few examples, so you mentioned your own course. Uh, I'm thinking of one example uh, where a claim was made to disinvite uh, or, or to intervene in a public uh, event when Jordan Peterson was invited to, to the UFAS room for discussion, an interview platform, and there was a petition made by several colleagues and, and students uh, at the UFA um, demanding that uh, uh, Jordan Peterson should have uh, should be accompanied with another guest um, uh, to have some on the couch, someone critiquing him, whereas the whole idea of room for discussion is just having someone being interviewed and there were like our prime minister has been there, uh, the IMF director has been there, and who knows who has been more like violent in their actions. Um, they or, or Jordan Peterson. Are you thinking maybe of, of these kind of, of, of claims to counsel indeed to, to intervene in the exchange of ideas? This is definitely what's happening. And listen, uh, Jordan Peterson, I think, is a, is a horrible person. Mm. And it's, he's very dangerous. Philosopher. In, in my view, uh, it's very dangerous to any pr process of, uh, of progress and, and, and uh, more inclusive world. 
Uh, but again, there is also academic freedom, and you have to really think. Eh? I think you can only uninvite or cancel a person if this person is crim criminally prosecuted or in prison. And uh, that's my view. I think it's very dangerous to say you're not welcome. I will say invite him over, and I'll make toast of him in a debate, and I want to train my students in arguing him off the table, yeah? and not cancelling him or personal attacks or... On, yeah, so that I think is is definitely uh, going on, and then from my own experience, I'm not even far right. Yeah, and what I think is uh, uh, I'm left, and I'm progressive, and I have a company in DNI, diversity and inclusion. I'm a gender and sexuality theorist, and even I mm. am seen and cancelled by my own colleagues and students for my views. So. Yeah, I think this is uh, this is tricky. Yeah, we have to uh, to uh, to be aware. Right. I think I'm going to uh, to continue just because I want to close in about 15 minutes, uh, Max. Uh, uh, just maybe also to take a historical perspective, um, the call no platforming, so offering not a platform at the university to undesirable positions, was actually started in the UK in the 1920s and 30s when fascist politicians started to travel to the universities to, in a way, rally for their parties. So this, this whole no platforming idea goes back almost a century now. As mentioned, we've taken a long history, a long historical perspective, but we're also uh, closing with uh, an idea on, uh, an eye on the future. Yes, there it is. So let me read again, um, if at all, what change or changes of academia would you propose in response to the claims of wokeism. Uh, maybe I can ask you to, to keep it somewhat brief, uh, yeah. so to allow uh, some uh, additions. I'll just... Uh, I'll yes, yes, indeed, you're uh, you first here, yeah, right. It doesn't work. Yeah, now it works. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah. So then I'll keep it at one point. I think, uh, just to follow up on the point I just made, I think it's very important to raise awareness of any form ex of extremism. That is what the woke students from the United States have taught me to raise awareness of my blind spots, of where I have internalized patriarchy, where I am a tyrant in myself. Yeah? And I think this is a confronting process, and but it needs to be done, because if we are not aware of it, then it expresses itself in the social world as a fate. Yeah? So we need to intervene and work on awareness. And I, will, I would like to say that it's very important that my left-wing progressive often progressive critical race studies colleagues and students, but also gender and sexuality colleagues and students, that they are very good in seeing extremism in the far right, but not amongst ourselves. And I think this is an urgent blind spot that I'm very worried about. And so this would be my number one priority, to raise awareness of all forms of extremism amongst ourselves. Thanks. Um, Marley, uh, would you yeah. have done to, if at all, so what changes? In response to the claims of wokeism, well, as I said, I really don't know what wokeism is. I'm, I'm, I, I, you can't persuade me with, with your examples because I really don't understand them. I don't know what the extremism is. I don't know what, what they, you, do you really think it's a threat for society? They call themselves, let, no, eh? let, let me it's Let a, me explain this. But it's this. a term they in themselves call. We're not going now to have a what, conversation what, here. Just okay, but you're allowed to say that you're extreme in your views. Radicalism doesn't mean that you're violent or whatever. You can be radical in your views. Yeah. And it can be that you want a radical transition and that you want it now. And unfortunately, most things don't go now if you call I want it now. Um, so, um, how to respond to people who want a transition, I would say, as, an, as, a, as a faculty, as a, as, a, as a university, you should listen to this, you, sh you should take this seriously and try to find out how you can uh, accommodate, accommodate a, a diversity of uh, personnel, a diversity of students, what you need to do for that. And for example, one of the thought experiments that uh, John Rawls explains in the theory of justice is that you sit around a table and you uh, wear a, a veil of uh, ignorance so you don't know what your social position is and so on. And then you talk about what would be the best uh, way to reach justice in our department. And 
if I look at our department, I see that it's very hard for the, 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 the older staff to accommodate to the younger, more, more diverse, uh, new uh, tenure trackers, PhDs, and so on. And there's a lot of resistance and very often called woke and so on. And um, since I recognize myself in this young person and I don't recognize myself in the more cons conservative people who are sitting there for ages, um, I, I think you have to find new arrangements. And for example, one of my PhDs um, has uh, recommended the, the whole uh, faculty that if we have research meetings, it's no longer the professors who start to respond after someone has lectured. No, you start with the PhDs. So you start with the people who are less experienced in talking in public. And in that way, the whole atmosphere changed. It was so much more open discussion. Uh, and it shows all, also to me that this idea of free exchange is very often in the advantage of people people who are privileged, who have the dominating positions. So I would say how to respond, find regulations, how to, how to change the culture in your department, how to uh, make everybody uh, comfortable, how to create a safe space, not by um, inventing all kinds of regulations, no, by, by talking at the table, around the table with each other, what, what do you want? Uh, to be the culture in our department. And uh, uh, the, the, there is so much experience nowadays in how women have to, um, ha have to make clear that, that, that some colleagues um, yeah, pass their, their, their boundaries. Mm -hmm. And it, it, for me, it's, it's, I can understand that a lot of male colleagues really don't know how to uh, how to deal with young women, and that you have to, t to learn them how to, to do that. But the only way to do that is that the new PhDs, the new personnel, explains why it's not safe for them. So you need to start um, meetings and discussions in your departments in order to change the culture that, that has been built up by the old guys. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, and on the topic, I would say indeed that kind of, you know, a lot of what I'm getting also from you is like one, let's say, dominant or hegemonic group replacing the other and essentially doing the exact same thing, which is, again, mm -hmm. something about more of a cultural shift within that particular department. But I do think also a very, very important thing to, to, to do is to truly scrutinize some of these um, fears and claims because I truly wonder like how the heck possibly could critical race theory be a threat in a country where there isn't a critical race department not one at any university like how does that work so i think we have to also be very careful not to kind of reproduce these threats you know um when they literally do not exist Thanks. Well, uh, yes, I'll get to you in a moment, but I just wanted to note, so uh, I, I've written down a little bit, so in a way I think the shared theme of the three of you is raising awareness, starting conversations, uh, scrutinizing the fears and the, and the claims. So it, it's really, um, I think what we are confronted with is also uh, as academics, as teachers, researchers, but also students, we can't just no longer teach from the books do science according to the books, but really engage in, in, in individual self-reflection and, and self-reflection as an institution in a way. So that's, I, I find really interesting as a joint uh, theme. Um, let's have the microphone where I did see, yes, there, please. Yeah, my point goes back to the examples that were given about gender and sexuality and uh, about uh, how to deal with these things in your department. And then Alana already said it, there's no gender and sexuality department also at the UVA because that's the one thing that has been canceled. The critical race. Right. Yeah, you said yeah. critical race, okay. but the same goes for gender and sexuality. Right. And we had, a, a, at, at philosophy, we had a women's studies, or there was a women's studies department uh, at, at the University of Amsterdam, and that was c canceled somewhere in the 90s, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some other contributions, your thoughts. So as closing statements, um, anything? 
What would your response be? What should we do? What should, shouldn't we be doing? Oh, that silence, one hesitating finger. Yes, please. Share your thoughts. Yeah, I just have a short thing to say because I find it extremely funny to talk about ec leftist extremism within the academia <laughs> when all the leftist extremism, extremism that I'm hearing is very mild to me personally. I call myself a leftist extremist <laughs> and I am totally, uh, yeah, I don't really see my calls and my opinions represented in the leftist extremists within academia. So I find it quite funny that you call it like a, a leftist extremism. Am I allowed to say something yeah, about uh, it? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah, but this is like the general taste that I often hear when I address these things. It's a sort of ridiculizing and denying uh, there is no gender sexuality department. Well, we have a professor and we have an Amsterdam Research Center in gender sexuality. And we have a minor and we have a summer school. So there's a whole network of researchers. It's deeply institutionalized in, in uh, the University of Amsterdam. And yeah, I think it's, 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 you can easily laugh it away, but the challenge is, I think this is what the woke students taught me, not to laugh their calls away for introspection. How I was totally surprised how I had internalized racism. I also think that um, on the same page in the left uh, of the political spectrum and also in a lot of my left-wing progressive colleagues and students, we all have internalized patriarchy. There is a tyrant in all of us. So my invite would be, where is it then? Are we all fantastic uh, citizens uh, who have nothing in our shadow anymore? Or do we also have aggression and a tendency to suppress, to control, to cancel, to silence? Where is it then? No, I, th I agree with this because um well, not all of it, but I do think, of course, even within these debates, all types of privileges, right, uh, filter through. So um, I don't need, for instance, you know, particular <laughs> students trying to tell me about myself with regards to racism if they have not experienced what I have experienced, right? But this is also... Um, kind of where we have to get into the discussion of, um, well, who has what learning to do? So like you were saying, you know, there are particular faculty members who are very ill-equipped to deal with certain conversations because they've never had to have those or they don't have any experiences of that. Um, so I guess your call is very valid and I think also for a lot of students, right? Yes, you're um, ri rising up for one particular thing, but also look at all of those other intersections of your identity, right? And um, basically what other privilege you, privileges you might have. But I also think it's not very fair to kind of say that we all have to have the same, you know, level of reflection. No, there's definitely people who need a little bit more <laughs> reflection than others. Um, like you were saying, particular generations maybe. And I think that that's something we need to not be too shy about saying, right? There's a reason that I can have really intense discussions in my classrooms about things that, about race, about Zwarte Piet, mm -hmm. and this is truly fine. Right? And that might be based on how those particular students look at me. Maybe they would be very, I don't know, aggressive or what it is towards you. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think that this is also something where we have to say, well, you know, if this particular um, faculty member needs a little bit more instruction or, you know, knows that they're going to face a different response from students, that we need to talk about that and help them facilitate while doing that instead of just saying, well, the student shouldn't do this and the student shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a bit of, too much of an easy kind of a response. Right. Maybe, but, but, but oh, yes, I, I think yeah. this, this student is completely right that the left extremism is almost absent from uh, university, which is surprising. Uh, if, you look, if, if you look, if if you look at the sixties, seventies, eighties, what students had the, the, the whole, the, the, for example, in the polit pol pol political department here in the seventies, you only got Marxism, anarchism, uh, communism, whatever. It was completely left politics that you got that you got that you got teach. 
And if you look at the streets, there were the squatter movements, the feminist movements, the gay movement. There was a lot of, um, um, uh, what is it, kind of revolution in Amsterdam with uh, squatter um, uh, demonstrations, occupations, a whole free uh, area where the police couldn't and the government couldn't enter. I mean, it's sorry, but you, you're su such quiet persons com compared <laughs> to the students of the 70s, the 60s, and the 70s, where the stones flew st through Amsterdam. It's they're, they're, sorry, but there's for, to me, it's it's I'm also always surprised that you are so less, so little active. I mean, if I, look, if I look at the, the, the threats of the climate change, I think, oh, if I were your age, I would say I, I would immediately go on the streets and the, the, um, ask, no, demand, what is it, require the, the government, do something. It's so threatening. And mm -hmm. so I would say, no, you're, you're, you're totally institutionalized. Uh, right. little we're asleep. Yeah. yeah, we're asleep, yeah. Sorry for saying, but. <laughs> I, and I think there's, there's uh, the, the university in that sense is also really a strange place where different generations are working together, teaching together, uh, learning and teaching together, doing research together. So the older generation that you refer to have to really uh, uh, freshen up the, 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 the discourse, etc., with a younger generation that is no longer throwing stones in the, in yeah. the street. Or occupying I, or universities. Occupy, well, we had the Maagdehuis yeah. occupation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Maagdehuis. Okay, we, we held a workshop on diverse, the lack of diversity in academia. But also I think there's also, uh, as we just uh, discussed earlier, uh, uh, the academic process or scientific process has both this, this uh, notion of progress and innovation, creativity. You need to like unravel other people's work. And at the same time, through peer review, etc., there's this conservatism. And I think we are, we are looking at, at, at a moment where the conservatism is quite strong, even though there are these, these claims for, uh, for revolution, maybe, in some, some circles. So uh, I think we can use some of your energy, maybe, there. Yeah. And I, I think with that, I also heard, like, just now, classes. classes. So uh, maybe it's good a time to thank our panelists for their contributions. Um, you as well, many thanks for your uh, thoughts and your uh, attention. Maybe we'll have some uh, drinks afterwards and you can still uh, engage in conversations with us. Uh, with you particularly also, Marley, to you uh, being on such a short notice uh, amongst us, uh, Alana and Laurens, uh, many thanks uh, for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you.